Hello and welcome to my um, le my fourth lesson, my first little uh, lecture on inspector calls. Uh, we have a guest today, and this is Belle, and it's just easier to let her sit in my lap <laughs> and do this than trying to keep her out of there. So she's going to behave herself, I'm sure. Okay, thank you everybody that is watching my uh, my first three lessons and leaving comments, and I will try to get these up as fast as I can, as I know it's a very important uh, play. And um, a lot of the exam boards use it for examining. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, we are going to discuss the role of women in 1912 and in 1945 and the monumental changes that took place between those two years. Uh, now remember, Priestley wrote the play, he almost said novel again, play in 1945, but he intentionally said it in 1912. And you will be able to address that question a bit more today, add more to it. Why did he do that? So again, to help with that as well, we're going to look at some of the historical context of 1912 and 1945 and how it relates to the play. Big changes for women, but big changes for everybody. The class, stu the class structure we talked about in Lesson 3 nearly completely breaks down in 1945. Um, rights for women, rights for everybody, a new form of government is uh, voted in. We're going to start looking at Sheila as a character and how she's presented in the beginning of the play. Um, we're going to keep it to the beginning because we are going to talk about Sheila and how she develops throughout the play in future lessons. She's quite a complex character. And then we'll look at a few practice questions to uh, basically give you some practice, obviously, and you can start preparing for those exams that are coming up. So let's begin. Okay, so we're going to start off with the role of women in 1912. Now, in 1912, women did not have the right to vote. They were what was called disenfranchised. Okay, so they were not allowed to participate in the political process. They couldn't stand for parliament, and there were very few work opportunities available. Now, this sounds ridiculous to us today to tell half the population you have no voice in who governs you. Absolutely. Uh, that's the way it was back then. So they were very reliant on men at this time. Now, I've done a separate video about the suffragettes, but I've just mentioned, mentioned them in here because they were a group that fought incredibly hard for women's rights and to get them the right to vote. Now, they were controversial because they took militant action. So it says on the slide, the suffragettes were a group started by Emmeline Pankhurst that fought very hard to gain the right to vote for women. Now, there were attempts before. There were other groups called the suffragists that believed in using peaceful methods. They spent decades demonstrating using peaceful methods, and they were just ignored. And finally, women had enough and said, we've got to take more drastic measures. Some of the things they did. Now, women, they broke windows. They set fires. Um, set fire to postal boxes, things like that. They destroyed property. They, not, they did not target humans. They did not target people, not officially. They did that because that's what was valued. They said that they would, the government and MPs would value property more than the actual rights of women. Um, hunger strikes. They were arrested, and it is worth noting that when they were arrested, they were charged as criminals. They were not given the status of political prisoners, even though they were campaigning for the rights of women. So they were, they were treated like criminals. They were treated very harshly and very cruelly. Many women went on hunger strikes, and to combat this, they force-fed them, which was a very painful process, and some women actually suffered long-term health damage because there were many times that this procedure was done by somebody that was not medically trained, um, didn't know what they were doing, basically. Um, there's a woman mentioned at the bottom named Emily Wilding Davison. Now, she's a very famous suffragette. She's known for, um, at the time, they said she threw herself in front of the King's horse at the Derby races in 1913. 
now with enhanced technology and um, the video footage being cleaned up, it looks like she was actually trying to pin something on the horse and was caught. But she ended up dying as a result of that action. And that really started to make people think women are willing to take such risks and die for this cause. If you're interested in the suffragettes and the story of Emily Wilding Davison, I have put another video up on that specifically on my YouTube channel. So please do look at it because it does link to this uh, very well because that's the era that it's in. Okay, bye -bye. All right. <clears throat> now, life for women in 1912, it was not really that pleasant in for a lot of women. Women were not only denied the right to vote, they were considered as inferior beings to men. They, they were viewed as almost children in the eyes of men. We had to be married. Men had to take care of us. We could not cope on our own. We were not as smart. We were not as strong. We were these fragile little things that men had to take care of. Um, women could not own property for a while, a long time. Once a woman was married, at this time she had to surrender all of her property and assets to her husband. They became his property. So if there was ever a woman bold enough to leave her husband or divorce, which was very rare back then, it took a lot of money and a lot of courage, the husband retained everything because that was now his. A woman was viewed as the property of her husband. So she was not viewed as a human being or an equal by any means. She was, re she was viewed as a possession, as property, and he could do with her what, she, what he wanted. Many did, many didn't. Now, it's worth noting that some universities did allow women in to study, but a lot of them didn't bother because most major professions did not allow women to practice. Women did work, um, but they worked mostly as domestics, uh, seamstresses, maids, cooks. Um, yeah, plenty of women did work, but the jobs they held did not carry the same status as men. So things like accountants, lawyers, doctors, incredibly rare for a woman to get into um, to get into that profession, uh, even to be allowed to study uh, those uh, those roles because the professions they barred women. Okay, we're gonna take a look at Sheila. Now, Sheila's a very interesting woman. Um, she is an upper class woman in 1912. So one would think, well, she's upper class. A lot of these rules are not gonna to pertain to her. Um, she's gonna be, she's gonna have it a lot better than a lot of women. Well, in some way she probably does. She doesn't have to worry about working for a living. But now Sheila, being an upper class woman, has a lot of responsibility because her life is going to be ruled largely by rules of etiquette and behavior. Women had very strict rules to abide by. Um, reputation was important. Your reputation was everything. And your reputation could be destroyed by a mere rumor that you did something. That you, you didn't need proof. All somebody had to do was say something. It, if the right pe people believed it, your reputation was destroyed. Sex before marriage, that was absolutely taboo for a woman. For a man too, but men tended to get away with it a bit more. But if a woman did that and it got around in the right circles, her reputation was destroyed. Now that could make a woman unmarriable. And that was very serious. If you could not get married... Who's going to take care of you? Who's going to depend on you? Because your opportunities are so limited. Now, Sheila and her status. Now, again, she is of the upper classes. She's very wealthy. Her family are very wealthy. High status, lots of prestige. Now, in the opening scene of Inspector Calls, the Burlings are celebrating Sheila's engagement to Gerald. Now, her second class status within the family is made very apparent because she is treated like a child. She calls her parents mummy and daddy. Um, she, you know, five or six year old uses those words, not an adult woman. She's in her 20s and they call her child. They refer to her as child a few times. They control every aspect of her life who she sees, what time she goes to bed, what she can do. And she's, a tw she's 24, I believe, in the play. So she should be 
a lot more independent than she is. And that's made very, very apparent in that opening scene. Okay, continuing on. Now, Sheila is in love with Gerald. It's not an arranged marriage. It's not a marriage of convenience. She does love him. But she is also looking at that institution of marriage as a way away from her parents. It's the way out of this house. Um, once I'm married, I'm going to have a new status. I'm a wife. Now, is that going to give her more freedom and what she wants? We don't know. It, it depends on her husband. But it, it was often said back then that a woman was um, transferred, the ownership was transferred from her father to her husband. So again, viewed as this piece of property. Now, Eric, her brother, is also introduced in that opening scene. And it's made very clear that he is not responsible. He is, you know, a bit of a playboy. I believe he's, you know, depending on what version of the play you watch, if he's, you know, a bit drunk in the first scene because they're celebrating. And he's given more status than she is. He's behaving rather immaturely like a child, but she is the one that's actually treated like the child because she's a woman. So she's clearly more mature than her brother Eric. However, she's still looked upon as having less status than him due to the fact that she's female. So in a lot of ways, Sheila embodies the position of women of her time, even though she is of a very high social class. So her class does not save her. Okay. Now the historical context of the play. Now again, in the last lesson, we talked about how the play is set in 1912, but Priestley writes it in 1945. And there's a world of change that happens between those two years. Now in 1912, the conservatives have a majority in parliament and the first world war has not yet happened. We're on the brink. We're getting there, but it hasn't happened yet. So this old class stru structure is still in place. The conservatives who are a party that is more, um, everybody needs to take care of themselves. The rich own most of everything. That's in place still. 1945, we had fought two world wars. This destroyed that whole class structure. It's um, it was almost gone and the Labour Party win a majority in Parliament. So now we're hearing things like better homes and better housing, better pay, more social reform um, in this change of status of women as well. This applied to everybody, but it um, particularly helped the status of women. Whereas before the upper classes, there was no social reform, there was no poor reform, there was no um, social, there was no social welfare system at the time. Now, what does this mean for women? Well, between 1912 and 1945, a lot changes for them. They gain the right to vote. They gain the right to vote in 1928. So now they have a say in their government. Women begin working outside the home. Now, they did start working outside the home in the First World War. The men were called away to fight. The, and then, of course, factories needed workers to make uniforms to make weapons, you know, machinery parts. Women took a lot of those jobs. Um, they took jobs in factories, but in with the First World War, as soon as the servicemen came home, the women were let go. And they still did not have the right to vote. So even though for a while they enjoyed this um, status of working outside the home, as soon as this, the war was over and the men came back, they kind of just were put right back into their old way of life of wives, mothers, domestic servants, you're the property of your husband, even though you've been making your own money for the past four years. But in 1928, women are given the right to vote. Now, they are again working in factories due to men being abroad and fighting the war. This is in 1945, I should say. Now, in 1945, many servicemen are still away and women have the right to vote. Now, there's a general election with many servicemen being away, they were not, they couldn't vote because the war was over, but they still hadn't all been brought back yet. Women are now voting. And now instead of the conservatives being in control of parliament, the labor party takes over. So the labor party start to bring in better social reform, start thinking of other people that share the wealth a bit more. Remember Priestley was a socialist. I talked about that in the last lesson and that ends the old class structure. 
almost completely obliterates it. Okay, so that is the end of the information uh, part of the lesson. So here are some practice questions for you that you could work on. How does Sheila demonstrate the condition of women in 1912? Okay, so we can talk about how she is treated, how her parents talk to her in that opening scene, child, how she refers to them, mummy and daddy. Even though she's a woman, she's treated like a child, like she's just this delicate piece of china that she needs that needs to be taken care of. She's given no status. She's under the status of her brother, who is very immature, intoxicated, and doesn't really seem to have a care in the world. Now, both of those characters evolve quite a bit in the play. Another one is what changes for women and how do women start to change things from the time of 1912 to 1945? Well, women start fighting back. They start saying, we're sick of this treatment. We want the right to vote. So they start taking change. They start taking jobs during both world wars. Um, and then, of course, how do things start to change? They're given the right to vote and they take part in, the, in that general election in 1945 and help labor win. Okay. All right, so that is the end of this session. I'm going to be back again, hopefully this week with another one. We might look at Priestley and how he uses the an inspector uh, calls as an anti-war sort of uh, piece of literature and some other aspects. There's lots to cover. So we're going to take this in doses, but I hope everybody is enjoying these lessons and finding them useful. Again, please do leave comments. Please do subscribe. And... Um, Good luck, everybody. Thank you.